Hello everybody, this is Lisa Johnson from Everbridge. I am the Senior Program Manager for Healthcare and today I am happy to introduce to you Kevin Kip Thomas from Boston University's School of Healthcare Emergency Management. Kevin will be presenting the 10 Keys to Healthcare Emergency Management Planning. Our agenda today will be a brief introduction of Kip. We're going to talk about the disaster life cycle three essential elements for healthcare services and in, in an emergency, the four pillars of an emergency preparedness plan, the seven characteristics of an all-hazards command structure, cross-department buy-in, metrics, the seven cardinal rules of risk communication, and developing a plan and drills. All right, I would like to introduce Kip Thomas to everyone. Dr. Thomas has a doctorate in public policy from George Mason University School of Public Policy in Fairfax, Virginia. He has over 20 years of military service, both in the field as a submariner and at the Pentagon as an aide to the Secretary of the Navy. Dr. Thomas was the founding research programs director for the Critical Infrastructure Protection Program at George Mason University and he had a 20 plus million dollar research program for developing and analyzing methods of critical infrastructure protection and cybersecurity. Dr. Thomas actively teaches. He has four classes currently, ethical and policy issues in health and medical services, experimental design and statistics for emergency managers, psychology, sociology of disaster methods, and risk communication and the disaster life cycle. Welcome Dr. Thomas. Thank you so very much for having me here. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to um, be part of this uh, this discussion and to be um, able to actually provide some insights on uh, on the emergency management process. I know that uh, our agenda is really full, and uh, and I I'm excited to try to accomplish all of the different themed topics that we talked about today or that we have on this agenda. I almost feel like we're, we're covering everything in one seminar, so if I do a good job, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'll provide some value and some benefit. But Lisa, thank you. Before I start, I just want to say that we really do appreciate partners like Everbridge. With us in the um, academic space, both in the research side as well as in the uh, education side, it's critical for us to find um, actors that are, that are actively doing things in the field that contribute to the professionalism and advance the field um, in emergency management and, and in other areas. And, uh, and finding a good partner, as we all know, is, is a challenge. So we're excited about that. As you saw on my first slide, you know, I've I, I, uh, been around uh, and been working on the emergency management process for, for quite a while. And I came to Boston University also to run a laboratory in, in neuroscience. Um, and we've looked at behavioral and social or group dynamics as well as um, pathological components through the medical school of different patient populations using different types of instruments, including wearable devices. I mention that only because I think it's useful to talk about how we can advance the research at the same time and also to give an indication of um, the endorsement I, I believe is appropriate for Everbridge in the process of communication, but also to talk about how communication is one of our key cornerstone problems in uh, in, in human endeavor. We have a hard time actually being able to communicate with each other and it's something that we will we will strive to to overcome until the end of time I believe. Um, so from from our perspective on of the practical in this uh, field we have the Masters in Healthcare Emergency Management. This one uh, was developed um, as a result of uh, work I did uh, when we were setting up elements of uh, the Department of Homeland Security. When I left the military and went to uh, work at Mason's Law School, we actually worked as the um, executive secretariat for the Office of Homeland Security and managed the public-private partnerships for the, the federal and national infrastructures. And we did research in that space to try to see how um, we could effectively accomplish what was necessary. And what was clearly evident in that to me was a lack of really understanding the implications of humans in crisis. I actually tried to create something called uh, the Center for Health, Infrastructure, Protection, and Security. If any of you can put the acronym together, it's CHIPS. And I uh, did it because of the TV show, CHIPS, because, you know, to effectively communicate, you have to actually resonate with people. I uh, couldn't, couldn't get people to invest in that. Um, similar to 
15 years before that when I was in the Pentagon trying to get people to put money into vulnerability assessments. I think our budget back in the late 80s, early 90s at DOD was $5 million for infrastructure vulnerability. And when I left the military, um, as I w went uh, into running the research center, the budget was $40 billion. So you can see how important um, this has become for us as a society, and, it, and rightfully so. Um, so our masters, uh, just one more quick second about that, it's to look at what is the theory to application to an applied way on how to deal with um, emergency management with recognition of the healthcare um, element. And that really just means that it isn't a crisis or a disaster unless humans are involved. And so the, the ten themes that are here kind of mirror uh, what we try to go over in the curriculum. Most people finish it in, in a year, or I mean in about 18 months to two years, but uh, that's enough about that. Uh, I think one reason that they wanted me to show this slide is the Simon A. Chernak Conference is an annual conference that we have. He was one of our distinguished graduates who actually worked in the program and he passed away, a young man. And he was actually working in the space of emergency preparedness for the Boston area in nuclear preparedness. So let's let's jump into this. Um, and jumping in, we're going to start with with the process of what many of us are aware of, the, the standard terminology and language. Um, disaster life cycle. Like any management life cycle process, because again, this is emergency management. Um, we need to understand what the life cycle is. Um, with respect to um, how we operate in in um, in this particular discipline and in, in this particular uh, space, so here we we all are aware of what most people think about when they think about disaster response. It's the one that is in the news. It's the one that makes sense to people, but it doesn't take into account what a life cycle really is, and it doesn't actually provide the framework that's necessary for us to understand on how to prepare or how to be ready for what's going to happen. So life cycle um, in general in management requires us to know what is our inventory, what is our business environment, what are the different things that we have to do to perform in our space, in our area of business or action. In a disaster framework, to be able to prepare or to be able to perform, we have to first think about what we need to respond to, and that requires us to prepare. And in that preparedness uh, process, we need to think about what are the things that might happen, um, how those things um, need to be um, handled, and what organizing structures need to be in place and protocols and practice need to happen for us to accomplish this. I think we're all pretty aware of all this, but it's just important to think about this not as something that's done once a year or every so often. No, preparedness is, as it should be, part of the life cycle. And as we continue to operate through our daily practice, we need to always think and keep in mind what can we do to better prepare. And as new and ways of action become apparent, we need to be incorporating those into our preparedness plans to be active in what we do. And then, of course, the thing that we hope doesn't happen happens, and we have to respond. Response is that proximal, acute, so a significant event that, if we've done our job in preparedness, will, in fact, go the way we want it to go. Um, the examples I can provide are um, the 9-11 response that Mayor Giuliani had put together. Um, because of we, we know this by many of us have read this, that he met weekly with the emergency preparedness coordinators in the city. He was able to recover even though they lost their main command center and their, their, their base mechanism of communications, their technology for communications, they were still able to communicate. It's one that is actually a little bit more absolutely uh, demonstrative of a good preparedness process is the Boston Marathon bombing. We had a number of people injured, um, a couple of hundred, almost 300, and we only had a very, very limited number of deaths. And why was that possible? It was possible because of the actions done in preparedness to make the different supporting organizations ready and able to respond if something did occur. Um, checking people in literally at the medical response tent, which was right there at the, um, the um, finish line at the marathon, into one of the 14 hospitals in the area. 
That would not happen, could not happen if it hadn't been thought through and prepared for in advance, and if there weren't the mechanisms of communications and processes put into place and protocol to make that happen. Response doesn't last for an entirely long time, but it is the most visible and the thing that people tend to think about the most. Then we get into recovery. Recovery is long term. It is that process of trying to take from that acute where we've shifted normal practice into this, you know, um, altered process, this emergency and crisis uh, process, and try to move from that altered process back into um, normal business. And that recovery. Um, if we've done preparedness and thought through how we would um, maintain our practice in, in times of crisis, it will aid in our ability to recover faster. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that if we've taken into account that critical assets need to be made available and need to be protected during crisis and alternate places to perform need to be um, set aside we can minimize the impact to those critical resources and then move normal practice back in in a more efficient uh, fashion. So uh, that was what was done in the Boston Marathon bombing with respect to um, service and care, certainly in the surgical suites here in Boston. Now the last aspect, mitigation. So mitigation. Mitigation is that, uh, that interesting one that, uh, that we, we often, uh, you know, wow, we could have done this better. Uh, we write an after-action report um, with the response. We say, well, we should have thought of this. Well, we should have thought of that. But we don't actually have the time to accomplish that mitigation often in the normal practice. But let's talk about what mitigation provides for you. Mitigation is where the business process of day-to-day -day action can be very influential in creating new opportunities for us by resolving those potential risks and creating benefit when we do that resolution. Um, boy, it sounded cobbledygooky, so let me make it make sense. Everybody likes to have hot water flow in their house, right? It's a nice thing. But boilers, when they first were brought into the process uh, in the 1900s, were very dangerous items. They changed the way we do business. They brought the motive force of steam into the practice of day-to-day uh, -day action in business. And they changed sanitary conditions for uh, the common person. But until we thought about the, the mechanism of how to provide that resource, we didn't think of ways to mitigate it. But now we actually have. It's taken us time. Um, but in every house you have in that house, one of the most dangerous things that could exist, you have a boiler. Um, one hot water heater has the, the explosive force to destroy a three-story house. We know it's a fact. But it doesn't happen. You don't hear it in the news on a daily basis. It, you do hear it occasionally, but the only time you hear it is when someone has purposefully removed all of the safety protocols that are put onto a boiler the upper release valve, the lower release valve, the graceful degradation of the bottom of the boiler that blows out at certain pressure. Well, you get some water damage in that case, but you certainly don't um, blow up your house. Um, but that's the prime example that I can come to about really thinking about how to mitigate possible negative outcomes from a thing that is critical and crucial for us to use. So if we think about mitigation and we think about how it keeps us to be able to use the critical resource that we know is beneficial to our society, we see how important mitigation is and we need to actually bring that back up into our process of thinking. So what am I arguing for? I'm arguing for the business of disaster planning. It is the cost of doing business on a daily basis that we need to be thinking about and not simply response. So essential elements of uh, healthcare services in, uh, in disaster um, allows me to start to uh, talk about some of the readings that we were able or articles we were able to share with Everbridge to you. Um, I have to be honest with you that, that just like all the rest of us, this is a fast moving space. Um, emergency management and the amount of people trying to think about ways to better perform in emergencies and the, the volume of information that is provided is staggering and it's overwhelming. Um, so I'm fortunate enough to, to have the opportunity, like I'm sure many of you, to work with some really great professionals. Um, part of our team is uh, uh, Bob McKee, 
um, Robert McKee was the uh, former director of Teeks down in Texas, and I asked him to look at my slides because you know I knew I wouldn't be able to do a great job, and he immediately found this Federal Registry, uh, which is the Medicare Medicaid Program's Emergency Preparedness Requirements for Medicare and Medicaid Participating Providers and Suppliers Final Rule. As any gobbledygooky legal thing is, um, I'm trying to find the acronym so I can actually say it. I don't know what it is yet, so maybe somebody will text it in. That would be cool. Um, in addition to Bob doing that, another person in our office, uh, Dan Meacham, professors in the program, looked at these slides too and added some components of what what are current rules and current practice in the joint uh, commission as well as summaries of how we should operate based on scopes of practice um, so I, I appreciate them immensely but I think I think we have provided you the main resource from this new rule I would look back to people like Everbridge to ask them to actually perhaps serve the role that they have taken up so so admirably to get you guidelines on how to effectively use these tools in the future. So maybe we can we can work uh, and see. We, we know Everbridge will do this. We know they're great people. Um, so what are, what are these guidelines telling us to do? They're saying we need to safeguard human resources. Well, back to the first point. You know, it's not really a disaster unless humans are involved. I think the best example I can give out of that is back in the 1920s, there was an airburst um, asteroid that hit in the, in the Russias and in, in way out in, in Siberia, and it devastated a landmass greater than the United States. Actually, I think it's almost equivalent to the entire North American continent. Um, it destroyed the forest. How many, how many of us really remember or know that one? I often ask all my master students, and they're like, really? I never knew about that. There were no humans involved, but about four years ago, we had some micrometeorites that actually fell in Russia in one of the small towns, and about 200 people were in that town. And when those micrometeorites fell, um, it became international news. And everyone remembers the images of these few people that were actually injured by these micrometeorites. No one was killed, but it, people will remember it. It's not a disaster or crisis per se, unless humans are involved or humans will be involved. So safeguarding humans, our number one priority, we've got to deal with that. I like the second one. You can hear I'm sort of a harping on this uh, concept, but I think it's very important. Maintaining business continuity. We have to be able to return to our, our business as usual. We have to bring ourselves back to, to how our normal operations of society perform as soon as possible. Um, we have to do it because it's what is the fuel that keeps our, 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 our systems working. And it allows for all the norm, all the people that are in our, our society to have um, assurances that they can have what they need. So we need to safeguard those. So that's another preeminent essential component of what we need to do. And we need to protect the physical resources that are there that provide for the underpinnings of what we can do. So what does the, this, the, the final rule, let's call it the final rule. What does the final rule provide as recommendations? You know, I, I, you know, I went through those 180 pages too, and, uh, and I think on page 32 they start to talk about these, but they're sort of intersprinkled. Um, but they actually talk about these four uh, organizing components, um, which is echoing back to what we've heard many times, we need to build our plans based on risk assessments that encompass the range of risks that we can experience or might experience. That's what all hazards is talking about. And not just that it encompasses the weather event and in isolation, the terrorist event and in isolation, the um, volcanic, volcanic or geophysical event, but understanding that any event has multiple um, components that may cross lines. So we need to know what the risks are and how those general risks create similar outcomes so that we can prepare across the group. So that's first, um, as we all know. Uh, and then we need to take into account what these underlying assessments provide to us with the knowledge of what we need to be, be doing to respond. So that's where we create policies and procedures. 
Here is one of the failures that we all are aware of. Uh, people write plans and policies and they put them in binders and they put them up on shelves and they meet the joint commission requirement that they have a plan and then you ask them where the plan is and they go, well, let's go find it and uh, an hour later they pull it back out and there it is. And uh, what, what does it say? Well, we're not really sure, but we wrote one. Um, now, implementing those policies and procedures in our practice and how we operate, not just writing them. Uh, number three, okay, communication. I, I, you know, I've said this. I will say it. I'll continue to say it. I think all of you might agree with me. Uh, communication is the hardest thing we do, um, certainly in, in a personal level, and we we're inundated with new technologies that tend to try to say that they can fix our problem. I'm reminded of little tools like Slack and other things, where we're told this is going to solve your communication problem without recognizing that communication is really a function of a two-way sender and receiver process and mechanisms that allow you to ensure that your message has been received and responded to. An example here is we have questions that are coming in. That's letting us know that you're actually hearing us and that we're there. Um, um, but without that, I could be talking and no one could, might not be there. It would be interesting, you know. I uh, actually am looking at somebody remotely who's, who's listening to me and hopefully he'll smile and I'll know that I'm actually um, getting the word out and he's hearing me. But uh, we'll see if that's the case. And he just did, so now I know you guys are hearing me. Um, so that communication process is really important to have the right mechanism to ensure that it's there and it's important to have plans that delineate what pe what is going to be communicated and when and by whom and how and how in disasters where those resources might, might not be there but also incorporate ways to measure whether or not you're actually getting the message out and then the implementing testing training uh, programs that things like the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program provide for training, drills, and exercises with tools that I think are pretty well thought out. The, you know, the, the measles and the exercise evaluation guides, you know, that are described under the HC process, which allow you to actually measure the success of, of that program and create um, changes or identify those recommended changes and implement those into your plan so that you're better prepared. I do have something to say about that towards the end. And Lisa's been so cool to me. She's actually flipping my slides, so I, I'm very happy. Um, the, the next component that comes from Joint Commission um, and really kind of addresses um, some of the characteristics of how we need to be able to operate in times of crisis are related to command and the process of command. When we talk about command, we tend to sometimes, if we're in the business community or the private sector, um, think about that as, well, that's a first responder or that's a military structure, as opposed to that command is really what we're trying to say is the leadership. Um, those managers and leaders that have roles and responsibilities that have specific duties that they must perform based on their job and the people that work for them that must accomplish the things that they need to do. As a retired career military guy, officer, I'll tell you it's a whole lot easier when you have a command structure and you can bark orders, um, but that isn't what's real in the uh, civilian setting, and nor do I think that it's, it's even um, plausible to think about that as the right organizing function for societies. I think we have to understand that the private sector needs to be vibrant, needs to have that fluid and flexible process but in times of crisis, we need to build into our private sector processes those similar structures that allow for very clear and bright lines about who's in charge, um, what you're responsible to do, and how that should be done. And we need to have the ability to understand what happens if something is missing or if an element or a component has been taken away. I think there's a new TV show which I think is kind of funny. I'm always trying to stay well, up to stu up to speed on stuff, and TV is my one weakness, or many of my one of my many many weaknesses. Um, there's a new TV show. Um, uh, it's a Designated Survivor, um, and it's you know here we go with uh, with um, 
everyone is gone and you've got one guy left and now he's in charge and he's got to make things happen. Because of rules that are in place, um, you have the ability to try to continue and you've been flexible in who you're, you're um, setting up to be in charge to get that word out. But you have those structures in protocol and practice, which, is, which are the clear delineation of what those roles and responsibilities should be. That gives you predictability of what to expect in times of disaster and what not. Well, now the, 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 the real truth. We all know that we're only as effective as, the, as the, our weakest link, and that's the accountable component, right? If that one person doesn't do what they're supposed to do, then what we think was going to happen won't happen and we'll be in a bad situation. I think the military does a good job about this by calling that person um, by the, they're called the belly button for that thing, meaning humans have belly buttons and you can poke that belly button if they don't do what they're supposed to do. Being accountable means that you, you identify that person to their name and to the role that they should have and who that alternate is. So accountability is very important. And then we need to know what we should be doing when we do uh, respond. That's prioritization. Back to communication. It's going to happen everywhere we go. Um, we have to have common ways and we have to be able to convey meaning um, and understanding, not just buzzwords. So that common terminology, I think that was a really good choice by Homeland Security when they took on uh, trying to get rid of 1017, 1024. Um, that made a whole lot of sense to get rid of that and to say, here's what I mean. Please open the door. I'm coming. Um, and then the ability to know my place inside my organization and how does my organization integrate or exist in my community? Where does it fit and how do I um, interact with the rest of my community? So I think this was a, a nice set of uh, um, structures that were put in place by the Joint Commission. So here, you know, and, um, I've had the chance to think about this um, um, and in this case, um, some of the other, some of my other collaborators here, um, we've written on this um, with respect to cross-departmental buy-in. So um, this article that, that's listed here and, and we're going to make available, I think, to you or Everbridge is, is only that an opportunity to show what we meet, what I'm trying to convey with respect to interdisciplinary awareness, cross-departmental buy-in requires me to have others understand what it is that I do. And that interdisciplinary awareness is that cross-departmental component of buy-in. If I'm an engineering department and I provide some form of resource um, and the marketing team relies on me to perform that um, and they don't do it, if I understand what it is that they're supposed to do, I might know who I'm supposed to call to get that taken care of. Let me make that real clear. My light bulb goes out in my lab. Who do I call to get my light bulb replaced? And hopefully I've trained my staff to properly call the right person. And I will tell you, even in my own lab, I'll say, call this person. And sometimes it might take a week. And then I just pick up the phone and within, I measured it the last time. It took me 17 seconds to have somebody in here replacing a light bulb. It took me almost a week to get my lab to make that telephone call. So, you know, understanding who to call and who does what, really, really important. And if you know what it is, 17 seconds versus weeks. This is hard. This one's really hard, especially in government. Um, you want me to tell you what my, I'm doing with all my resources, and you want me to share that to the level that you fully understand what, what's going on. Are you going to try to do what I'm trying to do? Is that scope creep? Aren't we all going to have our budgets cut? Isn't this a, a horrible thing? No, no, no. We'll take care of our stuff. You take care of yours. Back to old feuds and old rivalries, you know, the, the police versus the fire. That's my turf. You stay out of my turf. I'll deal with my thing. You deal with your thing. Well, guess what? Um, where it's been successful is when we've had leaders who know that they need to understand what that other group needs. If I think of Columbine and I think of the fire chief at Columbine, you know, one of the things that he talks about um, that he did was actually sit down with the police chief and say, what can I do with my resources, understanding what I know you need to do to make this mission more successful? And he turned one of his fire uh, trucks into a, a barricade that he drove right up so that they could move people out of harm's way. 
well, geez, fire chiefs, would you uh, you know give up one of your assets? Well, that was the fire chief's idea, it wasn't the police's idea, but that's an example of where they actually worked together and understood how they could accomplish the mission of life saving and extraction by knowing what each side needed to do. Not necessarily requiring every organization to build that ne that level of redundancy uh, or create actual redundancy, but to be aware of what's necessary so that you can actually um, uh, accommodate or find alternatives to create that resiliency. Resiliency is a buzzword that a lot of people have talked about. Resiliency means that we have shock absorbers that can withstand um, challenges, perturbations, um, and we don't destroy the, the particular organization or uh, capability. We have them on the car, you know, roads can get really bad, but your car doesn't fall apart because of that shock absorber. That level of resiliency is those other departments knowing, here's what I need and here's what might happen if I don't have it and here's how I can interact more efficient, efficiently together. So to do it means you got to, you actually have to talk to people. You got to find out what they do. You have to create that relationship in advance to know where trust is and to develop that trust to know what you can rely on when it's called for. Communications. Um, notification systems, tracking and accountability systems, and redundancy of systems. Systems in place. Not just communication, but definitely there's a theme on this slide to talk about the communications aspect. Um, as we've said, there are, there are many rules and requirements for communication. One is to get the word out. But to get that word out, as we've shown even today, you need to be able to ensure that it actually was received. So that's tracking and accountability back for that um, process. And then there clearly have to be redundancies of that um, process to get the word out to make sure people get it. So we've heard about those. Use um, you know, cell phone, text messages, use you know, emails, use different uh, mechanisms. But what I really like, here's where Dan Meacham, I, I'm just, I love, I love this. He's a young man, he's in his uh, late 20s, but, uh, but he's thinking about getting that word out and he put a bullhorn on here. And you know, in the worst case scenario, you can find yourselves back in the old times of the town crier, where you have only one last mechanism to get that word out. And so you have to be thinking about in a layered way that allows for graceful degradation. How can I ensure that I can get that message out all the way down? And then how can I ensure that it got out by getting the information back? But if we've done our job in preparedness and planning, and we have created mitigation strategies that allow us to ensure that we have alternatives to get the word out, we hopefully will have created an understanding and a capability to have redundancies that are robust, that allow us to actually not just send a 121 character text message that, by the way, on old systems used to come out of order, so you never knew what somebody was trying to say, so you'd ignore it, um, but actually send something, like we said, in plain language that says, here's what the problem is, and here's what you need to do. And then, because we have that level of ability to, to send the right message, and think about other ways to track. Maybe it's, you know, I don't know, cameras that show me how, what the, what, how packed I am on an interstate. Then I'll know if I'm sending people the right way. Hurricane Matthew is getting ready to hit um, in South Carolina. And as it's coming up the coast to hit in South Carolina, uh, warnings are going out now to say have people move. We know when they tried that down in New Orleans, no one did what they were supposed to do and people got hurt. Um, and they weren't tracking to make sure that they were meeting that timeline to get people out of harm's way. Hopefully we're learning and hopefully we're thinking about ways to get that notification out and then track whether or not people are listening to what we need to do. And we're thinking about it in such a way that we can recognize that we have created a complex web of systems, systems of systems, that we can exploit and we should. We should ensure that we're able to get the word out and make it happen. Well, back to measurements, right? I'm a scientist, so forgive me, but I will tell you, you can't f go forward unless you've actually created a way to, without bias, determine whether or not something actually worked or didn't. 
you can't know what the level of risk is to something unless you've actually measured it. Um, a good example of that is um, is last night, and I, and I often do this, and it's kind of silly, but um, I actually really like the idea of integrated, or I'm, I'm sorry, insulated concrete forms. So ICF building for houses. One, it creates a house that has the opportunity to be much more um, um, net zero. Uh, it has, it, it's more energy efficient. Not that I'm, you know, worried about that. Other than I want to save money. Um, so it has that opportunity. But when I look at that difference in building material, and then I measure it, and I take a stick built house, and I take and put a two by four into a little cannon, and I shoot it at a stick built house. So I watched this last night. I shoot it at the wall. One two by four shot at a stick built house at 100 miles an hour which, by the way, Hurricane Matthew is exceeding 100 miles an hour now and will when it hits the coast. One two-by-four will break through the wall and damage the wall beyond repair on a stick-built house. It'll do the same thing on a concrete block house. In fact, it, it devastates the concrete block house because of the way the concrete block is designed. But you take that same two-by-four and you shoot it out of, a, um, out of that cannon at a, at an, in a, at a newer building construct like an ICF building construct and it doesn't damage the wall, it doesn't shake the wall, it creates a small dimple on the wall um, which you could just take and put some more foam on and you're good to go. It doesn't even uh, reduce its energy efficiency um, and that's not at 100 miles an hour, that's at 200 miles an hour. So if we think about these things and we actually measure them in advance, we can make um, systems and processes and equipments and facilities that are more resilient and more capable of um, withstanding uh, challenges. And we can confidently get up every morning and take a hot shower and not worry about blowing up our house. Here are um, some, some cardinal rules of risk communication. We teach this particular set. Um, I can't take credit for finding it. In, in the program, I had a, a really challenging, um, young, exceptional person. Nina Shafi Kabiri is her name. She's getting her PhD with me now. One of those students that just asks you, why? Don't you know better? Why? You know, the people you love, right? Those are the people that challenge you. She came back to me in one of my risk communications classes, and she said, well, haven't you looked at Cavallo? And I'm like, uh. So we've embedded Cavallo, and I'm not trying. I don't even know him personally. I'm just telling you these anecdotes because, you know, I believe that we're going to get good information from people when they're part of the process of providing you input to work to build things better. Cavallo, I think, is great in this, and the articles I hopefully is going to get out to you, but risk communication requires that we do some key functions, and Cavallo's seven key functions, I think, are really useful. Accept and involve the public as a legitimate partner. In that regard, we don't want to try to say, oh, it's okay, you know, you, 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 you the construction worker, you don't really know what you need to be doing, so don't worry about it, you'll, you'll be fine, don't worry, we'll just tell you what you need to know. No, if I don't tell you what, what will inform you, you're not going to think that I am actually worthwhile, and, and you're going to think that I'm not giving you the full set of information. Um, we need to listen. Listen to what people are saying to us so that we can provide them feedback so that we can have them become involved. Um, if I think about the Boston Marathon bombing again, the only reason I bring that one up is because it's you know like a case study, not because we live here in Boston, but but we were able to see it firsthand. And when the police asked us not to walk around that next day when they were trying to um, apprehend the individual, um, we actually listened. And you know, oddly enough, people were compliant because they felt like they understood why it was necessary, and because of that, we limited the the overall impact of this act because it was contained, and so we got back to business as usual a whole lot faster. So everybody benefited because they felt like they were an active partner in the process. That said, we had um, a need to be frank and open in our communications. And I think that that was accomplished well, and that's something we need to continue to do. We need to look to credible people and get their input and feedback as we, um, we craft our plans and become prepared, and as we respond. And when we make a mistake, we need to say we made a mistake. Um, 
We need to meet the needs of the media. That meeting the needs of the media is being able to um, meet their cycle and to provide them the, the necessary resources that they may need so that they can actively um, provide the, the content that would flow out. Internet, power, that kind of thing. Need to speak clearly and with conviction or compassion and you know we need to think about what we're going to be doing and how we're going to respond and convey that in how we communicate those things. Um, so I said roles of, exer of uh, exercises are necessary to be accomplished and are important. Um, we had the, the good fortune of, um, of actually doing an exercise uh, which we called Hurricane Irene. And I meant to get that article to Lisa to get out to everybody. Um, but in, back in 2010, uh, we did an exercise called Hurricane Irene. We did it on the Cape. And that exercise was about a, a small hurricane coming up the coast and causing problems in a particular um, hospital or a rehab facility. And we planned it out. We actually had fun with that one. We went to the facility. We tested their backup generators. and Everything it was very operational um, exercise. Two years later, a hurricane came to the Boston or the Cape area. And in that particular hurricane, we act, they, they actually called it Irene. Um, and it was a class two hurricane, like the one in our exercise. And where we had planned the hurricane to hit, it hit, including the corner of the building of the hospital that we're at. And we had actually thought through which windows would break out, and they actually broke. It was kind of fun to, to, to have that level of thinking happen, um, sort of spooky and freaky at the same time. But the hospital was prepared uh, when it happened, and they were like, geez, it just seemed like you guys had actually called for this hurricane to see if we did what you had accomplished what we were supposed to do. Um, so exercises are really important. We have to learn from them. We have to test our plans. And importantly, we have to put that back into the process of building our, and revising our plans. Improving the plan. We have to do it often. We have to do paper-driven drills called tabletops. We need to actually functionally go do it. We need to do mixtures of that. Not try to take on the whole thing, but maybe test how we deal with one small aspect like uh, employee reunification or something along those lines. We need to take the time to actually write all these reports and learn from them. And finally, we have to be accountable. Accountability means that we have to really think about um, who's responsible for what and how those things are accomplished. And we have to hold them accountable based on, on what it is that they do. Um, accountability is a critical aspect of the process. It goes back to having belly buttons. To be accountable, we have to know what we're responsible for, which means we have to get all of these plethora of rules understood, and we have to then put into practice what they are requiring us to do. Some of those rules are here, the Joint Commission, the new final rule that we just talked about, but anybody in this world knows that there seems to be a, a new rule every, every minute, so how do we actively adapt to all of them? We need support agencies to help us get where we need to go. And what do we, what do we need to understand? We need to understand what it is that these risks are and how they're going to come about to challenge us whether they be from weather or chemical, biological, or you know, health and epidemics, terror, or mass casualty. Um, we need to think about this. We need to think about the interdependency of, of risks and put those into our planning cycle. Boy, I apologize. I think I tried to do too much. But, uh, but here is the time for us for questions and answers. Your timing is perfect. Thank you. Hi, everybody. This is Lisa Johnson with Everbridge coming back in again. Thank you so much, Kip, for your all of your hard work getting this together today. Um, I have a question, actually. If you guys can see the chat box down in the bottom, I'm just curious if you can tell me yes or no. Have you has anyone had a chance to look at the CMS guidelines? Um, they came out on September 16th. I'm just kind of curious if people have downloaded them, started going through them, if they've even heard about them. Just let me know, and that is why um, I'll be looking through your questions as well while you're answering. Okay. And just a reminder, if you are looking to do questions, there is a question box on the panel. You can put them in there. Just hit return, and I will see them. 
And also, just to let you know, I promise this will be brief, um, Everbridge is a critical communication and collaboration across the hospital. We definitely talked about that today, all the different aspects of emergency planning. Um, in our minds, it's kind of in three buckets. There's the, the safety and security, something like an active shooter or, um, or a weather event coming in. There's IT operations, which is, of course, critical to EMR management, make sure that the, the clinical records are up and running and accessible at all times. And then there's the, the, you know, the emergency planning, everything that we've been talking about today. So we do really think about those three areas of information. We do have communication plans in place for all of those areas, and they all talk to each other. So it's not that you're on separate systems and you don't know what's going on. What is your take on emergency management codes in healthcare facilities versus plain language? That's your first question. Um. So I, I, I always err towards a desire to go away from codes. I understand that billing codes and other things are necessary so you can have operating systems uh, respond to them, but they need a plain language um, counterpart. Um, for unifying a, a, a response team for a medical team, um, it's helpful to simplify actions into a set of procedures and maybe call for those types of procedures. I think we even do that when we say, well, this is a weather plan. We, we in our minds, organize that thought that way. But uh, if we're not communicating to a specialized group, we should do away with codes. We should use common language. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, by the way, also just to give you guys some feedback, a lot of you are saying that you have started looking at it. Um, we are looking at continuing to collaborate with BU and come up, come up with a whole series of steps that you can do that will help implementation because 186 pages is kind of crazy <laughs> to uh, glean out what you need to actually implement at your facility. Um, so the next question comes from Matthew, which is what would you think are the most important performance indicators for an effective emergency preparedness program? Uh, the fact that there's buy-in from your leadership to fund the program. The very first thing um, is whether or not there are staff positions and that in your organization for an emergency manager and if you're large enough, a support person in an emergency management role, whether or not there is visible um, presence for that organization for the emergency management process, meaning a web page and, and actual activity related to that. Are we having the mass notification drills? Are those pieces of information happening? And then how often are they happening? So that core piece is, one, is the institution paying attention to it? Two, is it demonstrating that attention based on its, its purse or its pocket? And then three, it's a function of, am I seeing it from my level that they're actually becoming involved? If you see that, then I think that's the, the key cornerstone. If we want to get into specifics of any particular plan, I, I'm happy to talk about that too, but I think the key thing is, is, is there a real recognition of the importance? The next question, uh, there's there's quite a few questions that are actually around this. Um, this one is best suggestions on getting nursing leads and employees involved. But I would also sort of expand that out to you know what what departments do you need to talk to? Who do you need to have on board? Do you need an IT guy? Do you need a security guy? Do you need somebody from the neonatal unit? <laughs> you know. So so the so the, the the sort of flippant and unfair answer is yes. Um, so that's unfair. But you need to do it in such a way that it makes sense. And I think we're beginning to get that understanding in something called continuity of operations plans. I know many are trying to struggle with those because it takes a requirement that everybody have a contingency plan. Um, and you can't just say, hey, my leaders have to have it. No, my leaders need to say it's important. And then it has to go all the way down to each operational unit um, for what that plan is. We do this when we run a Starbucks and that Starbucks it has a morning rush and you have a list of employees that are supposed to be there and you've got a contingency plan. If, if Sally and Sam and Tina and Tom don't show up, you've got James and, and Julia on a, on a rapid call that you can bring them in because you still have to serve that coffee. So we have that in a business way, but we need to be thinking about that with respect to how are my resources potentially impacted by different events and how will I ensure that I, at my level, 
and getting that information back all the way up to my leadership. I know many universities are grappling with this and certainly hospitals. And does that mean every unit in the hospital needs to have it? Yeah. We agree. <laughs> um, I'd like to kind of, I'd like to finish with a real world example today. Uh, since Hurricane Matthew is about to hit the Florida coast, they haven't had a hurricane in 11 years, um, possibly a Cat 4 when it gets there. South Carolina and North Carolina are bracing for impact as well. What, what would you tell a hospital right now that had a storm coming at them? What would you tell them that they need to do? Uh, first and foremost, pull out your plans because you built them and hopefully you're going to be using them. So make sure that you're actually getting them out there. And so alert your employees and your staff what the plan is, you know, in advance. Here is our severe weather plan. And here's what we're asking you to do. We thought this through. We thought it was a good idea to figure out who was essential personnel. And we thought it was a good idea to say who needed to communicate where they were and what resources they need. So number one, get that plan out and start following down the checklist of that plan to make sure that you're accomplishing it. And if you don't have a plan, which people still don't, Talk with others that might have a plan. Maybe you, there are providers that could support you, um, that can give you that information. Yeah, I, I would um, recommend if if there is anybody out there who's not listening, who is listening, who does not have a plan, um, you can actually email me directly, uh, Lisa dot Johnson at Everbridge .com, and I can try to find a hospital in your area that that uses our system that might have a plan that could help you. Um, not doing this as a plug for Everbridge, merely merely doing it to help. Uh, the safety and and situation of what's coming in the next couple of days. So, okay, with that, um, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you again, everyone, very much for coming. If you have any questions at all, you can email me, lisa.johnson at everbridge.com. I will be happy to take your questions and pass them on to Kip or answer, answer them myself, depending on the, the question. Uh, we are here to help. We want you to get the best information possible. You can also um, get more information. We do do webinars on a regular basis. We do really focus on having good, compelable, usable content. So you might want to check out um, webinars that we have on demand. We also have a large host of white papers. And um, Kip and Daniel have provided me with four downloads. So you will be getting a recording of the webinar. You'll be getting a copy of the slides. And you'll be getting four um, different documents that were mentioned during today's webinar. So you're going to get a nice little kit out of this. So again, thank you very much. We will see you all soon. Thank you.